Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And it's so exciting to have so many people from different parts of the world tuning in to the Saroy channel. And thank you so much for all your lovely, encouraging comments. And I'm so glad that you're enjoying the channel because that's what this is all about. There's nothing more exciting than a really great story. And I've got a fabulous story for you lined up tonight. I did get asked by one of my um, subscribers what Saroy actually means. So I think I will divulge that secret to you. Saroy means Sasquatch are real. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I, that's what Saroy actually means. And welcome. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Click the notification and the thumbs up. You are going to be shocked with tonight's story because tonight's story has a very different edge and I'm hoping you're going to be able to identify what this creature or these creatures actually were. This story comes all the way from South Africa and I just had to read it to you because it is utterly outstanding. It's just so extraordinary and I think you're going to love it. So let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Sandra and I live in Johannesburg in South Africa and I'm writing to tell you and your listeners about a very extraordinary cryptid encounter that my grandfather told me up growing up on our little Mahollisburg farm in southern Africa. His extraordinary story leaves me to conclude that there rarely are strange creatures living in our mists that so few of us even know exist. This is a story that horrify, will horrify you and amaze you at the very same time leaving you wondering what on earth these strange creatures actually were. All these years later, I am still clueless as to what think these things were, but maybe one of your listeners out there may have the answer to this curious question. My grandfather was a very cantankerous old man who was very opinionated and was not afraid to express his conjecture about things. He was not the most likeable character because he was always grumpy, fractious, grouchy, peevish and cranky. But to be fair to him, he had done his part and served in the Second World War in the South African Navy and was nearly killed on a couple of occasions. One such example was when a stray bullet went flying through his hat, leaving behind a large gaping hole. But it didn't touch him, so that was a narrow close a a shave, as you can imagine. Another time the ship he was supposed to be on was torpedoed, but he was luckily reassigned to another vessel at the very last minute. Once again, an amazing escape. He was one lucky man. The South Africans did establish an enviable reputation as sailors and naval airmen in all manner of ships during the Second World War and earned a formidable reputation as some of the best sailors in the world. I grew up in South Africa, the land long revered for the Big Five, as people flocked to our country from all over the world to observe the glorious wildlife here, with the rhino and lion being the greatest source of fascination for our tourists. We had a case more recently in the Lion Park that's close to Johannesburg when a Chinese man got out of his vehicle to take a snapshot of a lion and was mauled to death by the creature, while the bystanders in their cars looked on in utter horror, hardly daring to believe what, the un what was unfolding before their very eyes and wondering, wondering what had induced this naive tourist to get out of his car in the first place, which was the last thing he should have done. I cannot imagine what his poor girlfriend was thinking as she witnessed her boyfriend losing his life to this formidable predator that should never be underestimated because lions are powerful, majestic, magnificent but exceedingly dangerous beasts. There is also a huge crocodile in Zimbabwe that has got to be the most Herculean sized creature in the Zambezi River and the locals look upon him in awe and reverence because his claim to fame is that he's actually eaten three fishermen on the Zambezi. When I met him for the very first time, at a very large distance of course, I was amazed to find that this vast creature had somehow become quite a hero. To me he just looked like a grouchy, bad-tempered, hungry, monstrous crocodile, but to the locals he was a huge big deal. Here in South Africa we do possess some of the most phenomenal coastline to explore with its huge high breakers and vast areas of soft white pearly beach sand that stretches back for literally miles. Let's not forget the whale sighting seals and dolphins at certain times of the year that are a complete delight to behold and, and must seem for some tourists visiting our country because put simply, these monsters of the deep are absolutely breathtaking. 
I grew up in Johannesburg, once considered the most treed city in the world, although sadly I believe that is no longer the case, as many of those trees have been removed. I attended a private school with my sister Rosa, but both of us could barely wait for the weekends which we would spend on our grandfather's farm. One day my grandfather told me this story in his very own words, and he swore to me that this story is 100% true, and I categorically believe him. So this is a story that he told me in his very own words. One day one of my farm workers, Simon, was riding his mountain bike down one of the bumpy dirt roads that was surrounded on either side with high rugged embankments and rocky crevices, as well as vast open areas of wild yellow grasses, thorny briars, pretty fields of wild colourful pink cosmos flowers, prickly pear succulents and a scattering of indigenous trees. It was a beautiful sunny morning with the bright shafts of sunlight spreading their golden warm rays over the escarpment. Suddenly the worker heard this very peculiar raucous commotion which he described as the most ungodly sound that he had ever heard in his entire life. He said it was like a low guttural hissing and growling and the sound of major caterwauling as if two formidable apex predators were engaging in a huge fight. Simon, my farm worker, sensed that the whole area, although warm and sunny and bright, became cloaked with a thick veil of heaviness that was insidious, pernicious, menacing and unlike anything he'd ever felt before. If, if it were at all possible, it was as if the prolific, cheerful bird song had all but dissipated, and the only thing that could be heard across the valley was this god-awful, out-of-worldly sound that had more synchronicity to the gates of hell than to our reality. The worker told my grandfather that he was shaking so much and experiencing such violent heart palpitations to such an extent he had to get off his bike, which he placed upright against the hilly embankment. Even though he was filled with a feeling of impending dread, and he was frightened by that terrible noise that was far more formidable than a lion's roar, he said that an insatiable, overwhelming curiosity overcame him, and he just had to investigate what this strange creature actually was, or what they actually were. He was certain that anyone else on hearing such a huge commotion and sensing such an evil malaise would have literally hightailed it out of there a long time ago and as fast as they could. But he was not just anybody else. He came from a powerful Zulu heritage, a line of brave, heroic warriors, some who had single-handedly killed a lion in previous generations. He was not going to bring shame upon his family line by failing to remain strong in perilous, dangerous situations. That would not be acceptable. I knew if I just ran away that I'd always be left wondering what this thing actually was, or they were, and it would haunt me for the rest of my life and I would be kicking myself afterwards for not having the guts or the courage to investigate, he told me. Besides being Zulu, I cannot just run away, because that would make me a coward. My father had always taught me growing up that a Zulu man should always face his fears and be courageous, because that is what is expected of a man. I was shaking, trembling and breathing heavily. I could still feel my heart thumping in my chest. I ventured towards the noise and tried to make myself as inconspicuous as I possibly could by taking cover through a thorny hedge of briars that was sparse enough for me to get a clear view of these creatures, even if it did mean getting a little torn up myself, but that was a very small pie price to pay. Then I saw them, and nothing in this world prepare me for what I was witnessing. These creatures should not have existed in our reality because they easily belonged to the days when dinosaurs roamed the earth. They were engaged in an immense brawl, and quite literally fighting to the death, of that I was certain. The energy they exhibited between each other was one of intense hatred and abhorrent hostility. These hideously vile-looking creatures were colossal, easily ten feet tall, twelve hundred pounds, and six foot wide. But the most disturbing thing was that they were distinctly human-like. It was like they were half human and half lizard, or even Komodo dragon if you like. Without a shadow of a doubt, they were grotesquely evil and admitted a very sulfurous odour that smelled like death and decay. They were covered from head to toe with very rough-looking scaly skin, and they stood up on long bow legs that were thick, powerful and dense with muscle and they had very strong, thick, powerful tails. 
I noticed that they were three creatures, two that were fighting and tearing each other apart, while one was sitting back watching the show quite happily, seemingly unfazed by the whole affair, without an ounce of compassion or concern on its face. It really didn't care what the outcome of this fight would be. It was of no concern to this creature. I concluded in that brief second that it was two males fighting over a female, and whoever victoriously won the deadly assault would become the female suitor. Well, that was my distinct impression. I'm not saying I'm right, but that's what I thought. These creatures were the ugliest, most grotesque things I've ever seen in my entire life, and all of them had unique, individual, different markings on their skins. One was dotted in yellows and browns and reds, while the largest one had his distinct black and green markings, while the female was much plainer and was virtually a mottled brown ugly colour. The skins were like the patterns you will see on snakes. The heads on these creatures were utterly humongous, but flat with a long rounded snout, with the hugest mouth which opened up to reveal very sharp, deadly, treacherous looking jagged incisors. They also possessed human-like hands and feet, with jagged sharp claws for nails, that would easily lacerate your flesh in seconds. The wanton eyes on these creatures were deep brown and appeared insidiously evil and demonical. I watched these pernicious creatures tearing, slashing and ripping each other apart and lashing into each other's flesh with their sharp talons, all the while hissing, snarling and growling. The slightly larger of the two reptilian-like humanoids had the upper hand, as he was infinitely larger and more powerful, using his physical advantages, however slight, to his optimum leverage. I watched him pounding the other humanoid and holding him down with a hefty brute force, where he proceeded to bite out chunks of the creature's flesh, devouring them up in huge, gluttonous mouthfuls, all the while resuming his unceasing attack. His hideous foe was quite literally being eaten alive, while he weakly fought back with all his might, that was left within him until finally, in an exhausted act of surrender, he succumbed to his fatal wounds and finally died. Then the most extraordinary thing happened. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. The victor directed the female humanoid lizard to the dead corpse, and then she began to devour it hungrily as meaty crumbs of the creature messily, messily splattered over the grass. The male waited patiently until she had eaten her fill and then proceeded to finish off all the remains until everything had been devoured. I'd never in my life seen such a savage depravity before. But what were these creatures, I wondered? Were they left over dinosaurs from a bygone time? I could not be certain about that. The large repugnant male proceeded to sniff the air, and I noticed his forked tongue seemed to be sensing something in the environment, as if he was detecting an interesting curious smell that he could not fathom and was not well acquainted with, but whatever the smell was, it was of great interest and curiosity to him. I wondered what it was that he was smelling, and then suddenly to my horrified realisation, it suddenly dawned on me that he'd obviously got a whiff of me, and it was me that he was smelling. I had no idea what to do because I was so incapacitated by the petrifying, alarming realisation that this thing could come after me literally kill me, devour me, but worst of all, eat me alive. That was my biggest fear. I was left with two choices. One was to get back on my bike and ride back to the farm as fast as I possibly could, or the other was just to stay very still and hope the creature just lost interest in me and went away. I decided to remain very still and hope that the creature would lose interest in my smell. But lose interest in me he most certainly did not. And to my horror, this foul, malevolent creature began to forage around in the bushes and undergrowth, looking for the source of the smell. Before I knew it, he was there eyeing me down with the most wicked, treacherous, diabolical brown eyes that I have ever seen. For a second, he was very still and just stood there glaring at me through his predatory eyes that were devoid of any humanity whatsoever. It truly felt like this creature wanted my very soul. I let out a shrill scream as the creature pounced upon me and bit into my arm, and the pain was excruciating and shooting through my body like violent, violent fireworks erup erupting in agonising explosive spasms. I fainted in shock and terror, 
becoming momentarily unconscious, which may well have been my saving grace. The male humanoid carried my seemingly motionless body over to the female. I think he thought I was dead. He placed me on the ground before her and presented me as another trophy for the female to banquet and feast upon. Possibly he thought he would score more points with her as a potential suitor. And as he placed me down before her, I sensed his ego was very inflated by pride. And it was as if he was saying, look what I got for you, another tasty meal. Am I not worthy of your attentions? I'm glad to say that it would seem that the female's appetite had all but receded, and she had very little interest in eating me at all. I think she was simply not hungry, and she eyed me with a very little interest as if her powerful suitor had presented her with an offensive, pathetic offering. She let out a disgusting, disapproving grunt to express her complete displeasure and proceeded to totter away on her long, thick bow legs. The male looked glum and very disappointed by her disinterest in his prized trophy. All this time I played dead, because I figured if they thought I was dead they would falsely believe that I could dine, they could dine on me later, and when they were distracted that would be my opportunity to slip away. Well, that was the plan that was unravelling in my head anyway. The large male suddenly threw me over his massive shoulders like a sack of potatoes, carrying me into an underground cave system that I didn't even know existed in this part of Mahollisburg. I was being carried through a jumbo-sized maze of underground tunnels that twisted, spiralled and curled like large freeway system of some kind. The inner structures of these seemingly endless long underground tunnels were solid, strong and tall, made up of bright red dirt and heavy boulders caked together to create powerful foundations. To my horror, there were dozens of these hideous creatures bustling around, and the place was a hive of activity, giving me the impression of a very busy city. There were quite literally colonies of these strange humanoids, and they appeared organised, intelligent, and seemed to have a very distinguished, orderly and structured hierarchy system among them. Well, that's what the fleeting impression was that I got of this underground labyrinth, re but it reeked a high heaven, smelling exactly like rotten flesh. The big creature threw me down in front of this large brown reptilian humanoid that towered above him. I think it may have been his mother or some kind of other female of prominence in their society, maybe even a queen of some kind. Who knows? I noticed all the females appeared to be a very dull, ugly brown colour, while the males were speckled like colourful snakes with varying mottled patterns and colours on their reptilian scaly skins. The female was hideously ugly but titanic in size and girth and about thirteen feet tall, but when she saw me lying before her as a rather scrawny offering, she bristled and erupted in an indignant furor. I could tell that she was incandescent with rage. She made a furious cacophony of noises, and finally she grunted in displeasure, clearly appalled and offended by the very sight of me, and her nostrils flared in disgust as she smelt me. When she looked at the reptilian that had presented me before her as some kind of a gift, she oscillated her claw-like hands towards him indignantly to express her complete revulsion. Even I was shocked to find that these creatures found me to be repulsive and piteous. Suddenly a speckled yellow and white reptilian creature came scuttling forward, and listening to the grunting female's moans, he obediently upon her orders slung me over his shoulders and took me away from her fast. Finally I found myself being carried out of the cool darkness of the cave, into the bright, startling light of the sun which was so dramatic in its contrast that my eyes began to water. Before I knew it, the creature tossed me on the ground like I was a heap of revolting, disgusting rubbish that he wanted to discard. I luckily fell onto a large, soft, grassy verge, where my fall was softened by the cushioning of the thick undergrowth. For a while I stood there, unable to believe what had transpired, and it amazed me to see that I was still actually alive, but the wound on my arm was a painful reminder that I needed immediate medical attention. It was still bleeding profusely, but I could tell a deep-seated infection was coursing its way through my tissues very fast indeed, and my life literally hung in the balance. I managed to walk back to the farm, as taking the bike was no longer a viable option, as the escalating pain surfing through my body was so immensely traumatic. But despite all this, I did manage to hobble back to the farm, which was the most arduous journey of a lifetime, 
as every second caused excruciating anguish for my poor bedraggled pained body. And so it was my grandfather told me this amazing extraordinary story. His farm worker had to have his arm amputated to prevent the terrible infection from shutting down his entire body. The bite from this creature had caused a flesh-eating disease called necrotizing fasciitis, which means that all the dead tissue had to be removed, and the surgeon at the time believed the safest course of action was a full amputation of his entire arm. My grandfather knew that Simon was a reliable, honest and dependable person who was not given to making up stories, and so he went to investigate the area for himself, opposite to where his bike was still standing propped up against the embankment. He wanted to see if he could see any physical evidence of the fight that these creatures engaged in. He did not find the underground cave system, but there was a great deal of high rocky elevation in the area, so the entrance of the cave could have been well hidden, secretly by those creatures. He did discover pieces of scaly flesh connected to tissue lying scattered on the ground that was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Simon, my grandfather's loyal and devoted farm worker, did live for another twenty years after his harrowing ordeal with these scale-like humanoids, but he was not the same man after that accident, because he continually suffered the huge effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. My grandfather believed he would never be able to come to terms with his encounter with those heinous creatures. As for my grandfather, he must have died well over forty-five years ago by now. I never forgot the story he told me which I thought might be of interest to your listeners. On the subject of Bigfoot, I don't know actually of any counters here in Africa of the mythical beast, but I suppose anything is possible when it comes to the hairy man. Maybe he is around and people have had encounters and are not talking. That could be possible. I know that both Simon and my grandfather never shared their stories of the strange reptilians for the fear of ridicule and disbelief, which is also the case with Bigfoot encounters. I think if people did see Bigfoot out here in South Africa, they would not be keen to share their story with anyone. So maybe there are people sitting on their secrets like a hen on her eggs. Who knows? It's very plausible. I hope you enjoyed my story. I just want to say to you that that was a phenomenal story. And if anybody listening has any idea what those, you know, those creatures were. I mean, I just can't imagine what they could be. Um, please do let us know. Until next time, goodbye and good night.